let's hit it. And welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about? And welcome back to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I am your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled that you can join us today. If you liked our opening music, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band featuring Maya Dore. And you can download that on any of your favorite music platforms. They just... Um, did such a wonderful job for us on that music. I just love saying thank you. And I also want to say thank you to all of you, our, our listeners, our followers. Um, the way you share our programs is beautiful. And again, thank you from the bottom of my heart on that. For those of you that are new, um, basically we are about giving sound information, not just sound bites. We want to have real conversations with people actually doing something about dementia and have ideas and products and tools to be able to, to share with you. Alzheimer's Speaks Radio has partnered with the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action Team to provide resources for caregivers and people living with dementia during the pandemic. As many listeners know, I initiated several interviews when the onset of COVID started using a panel of people from all over the world. And once others started doing that, I stopped. I thought everyone doesn't need to cover it, but it seems like it's slowed down again now. And we need to know what happened in the first wave and what people are doing now. And Roseville AD, as we call them, has lined up a beautiful series to help us out with that. So before I introduce our guest, I want to first give a shout out to some great organizations because they're doing marvelous work that can help people, especially during COVID when people are feeling isolated. One is the Memory Cafe directory where you can find where virtual memory cafes are taking place. And the nice thing about virtual is it doesn't have to be in your neighborhood anymore. If you've got a uh, phone system, you can you can dial in that way. Or if you have the computer, then you can go ahead and do, do video. So go to the memorycafedirectory.com for more information there. Also, we just launched uh, something called Dementia Map, which is a global resource directory, and it helps those diagnose their families and professionals. It serves all levels. So go and check out Dementia Map at DementiaMap.com. And then I want to give a shout out to Coral Health because during the pandemic, they are allowing people to download their apps for free. So you can get Music First and Coral Faith free. And Coral, they spell C-O-R-O Health.com. Now we're going to go ahead and listen to the Foot Bar Walker and we'll be right back. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle? to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. So welcome back, everybody. It's time to uh, learn about the Roseville Alzheimer's and dementia caring and coping 
during a pandemic series. We are gonna introduce you to two wonderful women who I've had the privilege of working with them both because I'm a founding member of that group. The first is Sarah Barcel, who is the organizer of the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action Team. She also heads up the Dementia Friendly Airports Working Group and the Roseville Community Health Awareness Team. She is a mover and a shaker, and you wouldn't believe all she has accomplished with these groups. When she's not organizing something, you can find her in her garden. But again, gardens are kind of dormant right now here, here in winter, so we'll ask her what she's doing uh, wintertime-wise there. The other is Paula Beaver, and Paula is an active member of Roseville AD, as well as the Dementia Friendly Airports Working Group. And she also volunteers for the Louis Body Dementia Association, and she facilitates two support groups, one for Louis Body Dementia Care Partners, family and friends, and another for people living with Louis Body um, disease themselves. So welcome, ladies. Sarah, in your introduction, I had um, also mentioned that you love to garden in your spare time, but that doesn't work out so great in Minnesota. So what do you do in the winter? I find other projects to work on. I try to uh, complete some of the uncompleted knitting projects. Okay, well, I guess that doesn't surprise me because you're and I design garden pieces. Too often. So we're lucky to have Sarah with us, period, uh, to sit still, because she is really, like I said, a mover and a shaker, as is Paula. Um, both are so organized in terms of seeing kind of global picture and really pushing things forward. So I'm, I'm excited to be collaborating with you guys on this project with the Caring and Coping series. So Sarah, I wanna start with you. And if you can just explain to people what Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action Team is and why it was formed. Maybe we should start there. So in 2013, some of us became aware of the fact that Roseville had the largest population over 65 of any municipality in the state. There was attention that was starting to be paid to the incidence of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. Mm -hmm. And ACT on Alzheimer's was just doing pilot projects and I attended one of them. And when I came back from it, I approached uh, Pat Trudgeon, who then was assistant city manager and also Lisa Edstrom, who was on the uh, school board. And we basically said, gee, can we have a meeting to see if there's any interest in doing something about this? And the upshot was there was interest, we had a meeting and Roseville AD came out of it. And what we wanted to do was to provide, first of all, we wanted to provide connections for the service providers because we found that everybody was siloed, nobody know knew anything about what anybody else was doing for senior services. And then we wanted to provide information and support for the informal caregivers who were living in Roseville and in the area. So we got the support of the city. We got the support of the city in terms of supporting um, our webpage. That's completely unheard of. I don't know of any municipality in the States that has anything like that. We got the uh, support of the Ramsey County Library and the fire department and the police department. So we then tried to identify what could we do that would provide substantive information for people because we do not have a social service provider in the city of Roseville. And so we explored what was possible there and it's been ongoing ever since. It sure has been. When you were mentioning those names in the beginning, I, I mean, I remember when we were just starting and it's kind of like the little engine that could, you know, and kept pushing up the hill and up the hill. And like you said, I, th I believe, and I talked to a lot of people around the country, that Roseville still is the only one who has dedicated a page to Alzheimer's and dementia on their city page and kudos kudos to them for doing that and being so insightful. I want to talk to you about, you know, the first projects that the Alzheimer's AD developed, what, you know, one of which was the Caring and Coping series. And how did that come about and what types of topics have you covered? Okay. 
it was apparent that there was a lack of information and people didn't even know where to turn to find information. The only source seemed to be the, uh, the branch of the Alzheimer's Association and that had some information but not what people needed for local use. So we tried to brainstorm what kind of information did people need. And we, we decided they needed information on how to pay for senior care because nobody knew and nobody knew about the social work programs that are available depending on your income. Mm -hmm. And people didn't know anything about what the diagnostic testing was. And some people were very frightened by the psychological testing. So we had somebody come and we demonstrated some of that. People didn't know anything about what activities were available. Uh, there was very little information about any kind of respite care or what were people living with dementia capable of. And so we really wanted that information to be out there. There was no information about hospice or palliative care and what its role was. So we just tried to find experts in the field, people working in the field who could come to the library and make a presentation and then take questions. So they turned out to be three hour presentations, which is kind of a long time for anybody to sit, but they were remarkably valuable. And some of them got taped. So some of them are still accessible through the website. But I, I think that what it did was to also allow people coming to those presentations to lose a little bit of the stigma because they saw that they weren't the only ones in this situation. That was true for the caregivers. It was true for the people living with dementia. And we found that we also had a population of people who were anticipating that this would be a condition that would, they would have to deal with. And so we've had a lot of those people coming too. And then the other outgrowth of the dementia caring and coping presentations was that we put together what started off as a technology fair and then eventually evolved into an annual senior services fair. So that would take the place of, I used to be in June, and we had providers from all over. People could come and, you know, stop for two minutes or a half an hour, whatever suited them, and walk around. It was in the Oval, and they could try and find out more about re what resources are available. Yeah, and, and the the fairs were just marvelous. And even the caring and coping, you know, I mean, there were times that, that room was packed with 80 to 100 people and sometimes even overflowing. So this just shows the impact that you've had and the need that has been there and um, the arranging kind of for set dates so people could put them on a schedule. Paula, what was the first time in the new series called Dementia Caring and Coping During a Pandemic? Um, when did that come up and how was that proposed and developed? When the pandemic hit, everything stopped. We had a series going of presentations that we had planned out for the entire year of 2020. It was a whole package of presentations that worked together, like a lot of different uh, services and providers. We, we didn't know what to do. There was lots of conversation about what sort of things we could do to take the place of our in-person presentations. And we started down the road of figuring out what to do, how to get things on board. Finally, during uh, one meeting, we were talking with various care providers and people who worked with seniors in various roles. And they started talking about how they were coping, what they were doing to reach out to seniors, to people with dementia, to caregivers, how they were able to work within the severe restrictions of social isolation using new technology and creating new programs that actually worked with that technology to break through that isolation barrier. We decided this was extremely valuable information. We wanted to present a series about how various services were being provided during the pandemic, how people were coping with providing their clients valuable resources to keep things going and not cause decline and depression and other issues that can come up when people aren't able to continue normal activities. So that's how the idea was born that 
we could do a series of presentations of service providers presenting information about how they coped with the pandemic and what they are now providing and what they will continue to provide once we are able to meet in person. Some of these ideas are going to be continued because they really have provided a way of connecting with folks in their own homes that we just didn't see before. It is interesting because they talk to people all over the world and they're all saying the same thing. You're exactly right. They were like, you know, in some cases, their reach is much bigger going this route. And some people, you know, can't adapt at home um, and don't want to call in if they don't have a video for a Zoom type meeting. Um, but many are finding that there's more people that they're able to reach and connect. And the technology that is shared within those groups is then blossoming within their families. And they're like, I can do this. I didn't know I could do this, you know? And so it's, it's taking on new directions from all of a sudden people are saying, hey, we can still have the book club or we can still, we can still have our prayer chain or we can still you know, have our Bible um, class, whatever it might be you know, for people, they're still connecting. And so that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful piece there. Sarah, another project that the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action Team was involved in was a joint um, venture with the Ramsey County Library called Memory Minder Kits. And these have been so popular and kind of reinvented even and shared um, all around the world. So why don't you, sh why don't you talk about that? Sure. So we, we took the idea of book bags that you can check out of a library if you have little kids. And we thought, how do we make something comparable for the care partners, the caregivers, and the people who are living with dementia so that they have activities and information? And we approached Ramsey County Library. Carol Jackson was our connection at the time. And we also approached a number of because we had no budget. We approached six different service providers and asked them to contribute money to pay for the materials. And people in Roseville AD identified what they thought were useful pieces of materials, uh, activities and such, and then Carol purchased those and put them together. So now this is the second edition of them. There are kits for people who are living with, basically with Alzheimer's, and they have three activity levels. So there's basic, there's medium, and there's high functioning level. And then there are kits for people who have Lewy body disease. And then there are two kits for children who have somebody with dementia in their circle. And the kits for the adults have information, specific information for the care partners, for the caregivers. And then they have activities that can be done with the person who has dementia. And all the, there are, I think there are 60 kits all together. There are 30 of them at the Roseville Library and 30, I think, sit in Shoreview, but anybody can request one. And the kits are similar, but not identical. Mm -hmm. So if you went through, if you needed kits with moderate activity level, you might find 10 different kits and they would have some of the same things and some different things. And you can check them out for three weeks. We found that those were really a useful thing to put together. The other thing that came together was a memory reminder kit, which we called a travel kit. It's, and you were part of that, Lori. It's, it's detailed information and suggestions for how to travel locally from your house to the grocery store or internationally, whatever it happens to be, with detailed information from care partners explaining what you might need to consider to make it a successful trip. And so that material is still available on the Roseville AD webpage. People can download it and put it together themselves. They need, you know, there's some updating that's needed, but most of it's very, very useful. So that's what the kids are. That's fantastic. And I don't know if you know this, but um, here in Minnesota, another county got a $90,000 grant and they did 10 libraries that they set up with, with dementia resource centers. It was just beautiful. Wonder. And there are many libraries around the country and actually around the world who have adapted this process. Great. 
And, and that's one of the things that I love about Roseville AD is their willingness to share concepts and ideas with others and say, go for it. Let's, let's help people out and work together. So that's wonderful. I also wanted to um, have you describe the staycation project, which was about to launch right prior to COVID hitting. Okay. Um, Amy House, who is the Reflections Director for Brightendale, which is a Silvercrest community. Amy had told us, she's part of Roseville AD, and she said, you know, we have field trips for our participants, our residents, every week. And so she started collecting information from the different locations, asking the people who were coordinating the trips what their experiences were and how they worked. And then she approached Silvercrest. And so in partnership with us, with most of the work done by Amy and the people that she worked with, they put together detailed instructions for how to make a successful visit to local entertainment and other facilities. So it ranges from the Bell Museum through uh, Como Park Zoo, and there's an apple farm, and there various things. So there, there are 11 different sites right now that are cooperating with this. There is information about whether or not they're wheelchair accessible, and what does that really mean, so that you're not pushing somebody uphill and, you know, it doesn't work very well. Uh, bathroom availability, food and drink availability, whether or not there's uh, assisted hearing, uh, component available at that site. And then the people in our group, in conjunction with Amy putting this together, identified five questions that you could use or topics you could use with the person with dementia when you visited that site so that you would have ongoing interactive discussions. And then there's more information about that too. So it's it's a way to promote conversation, to promote interaction, to allow people to get out of their homes and do something that's of interest, that's out and about when COVID-19 is finally no longer a consideration. There w the intent is to have more sites added to this list. Wonderful. So again, it's a concept that any community could replicate. What you need is, you know, somebody who identifies the questions and the sites and goes out and connects with them. And then you need a partner who helps pay so that you can, you know, print nice brochures and things like that. But it's, it's accessible in our case through the website. So it's electronic, but it's also accessible in hard copy through the library. Paula, anything that you want to add to that? I believe that the memory reminder kits are still available at the library. People can yes. check them out and do drive-by pickup. Yes. And also the staycation idea is something that people can expand on their own. They can use those questions and sensory experience tips to help create their own travel experiences by giving them ideas of how to interact well on an activity with somebody with dementia. I've, I've looked through quite a few of the different staycation uh, flyers and uh, it's, they're really very good. Wonderful, that's, that's fantastic because people, people need that. Sarah, since we're talking, you're, we're kind of talking about stay vacations, what, why don't we talk a little bit about the dementia friendly working group that you're involved with and what's going on with TSA. I know a lot of people aren't hopping on planes, but that doesn't stop your group from moving forward. We suggested to MSP airport and they adopted the suggestion and they have just joined the hidden disability sunflower program. So there is a, I don't have it with me, but there's a lanyard that has a sunflower on it. And, and the whole point is that somebody chooses to self-identify as somebody with a hidden disability, which includes dementia. The expectation is that in any facility that recognizes the lanyard, that people will be a little bit more understanding if somebody mm -hmm. has that symbol on them. This is a program that started at Gatwick Airport in 2016. It's expanded. There are 50 something airports around the world that are using this right now. So 
we're very happy that MSP has adopted it. And now we are working on trying to get it adopted throughout the state of Minnesota and also sharing information with people in other states. That's that part. Um, we had a survey that was out and the data that came back from the survey, it was basically tell us your airport experiences. Uh, and the data indicated that one of the areas that people had difficulty was going through security. And so we received uh, an invitation from TSA uh, National, the uh, disability coalition group there, to provide suggestions for best practices for how could TSA security agents handle people coming through security if these people had dementia and, and how to also address the needs of their care partners. And that material was shared nationally back in October with all the TSA security agents. We're now looking at producing other tools that we can share so that what we want to do, we're not in a position to change the legislation, but we want to emulate some of the hidden disability friendly protocols that especially are used in the United Kingdom. And so we're connected with people there, we're sharing the information and we're trying to see what is, what is the main point? What are we trying to accomplish? And is there a way we can do that without addressing legislation? And so that's why dealing with TSA, we put together a website and there are uh, lots of detailed tips on what people traveling should do in preparation for traveling and how to get through the whole travel experience with respect to the airport. So that's the kind of thing we've been doing with that. Fantastic. And, you know, we did do an interview about do you travel and learn about the dementia friendly airport. So I'm going to post um, both links for the video and then just the audio. So if people want even a more in-depth idea and they'll be able to see the lanyard uh, when we did the interview you had okay. that with and stuff. It's just amazing how much uh, impact the group has had. Paula, can you tell us a little bit more about the upcoming series, you know, Dementia Caring and Coping during the pandemic and who will be participating and um, who is this targeting? Who should be watching? We're going to target both caregivers and service providers at first thought, well, this would be a good way to get information out to caregivers about various activities and resources that they could utilize in caring for a person with dementia. But we quickly realized that this is also something that care providers and organizations would have a lot of interest in hearing what sort of things other groups have done. We really want to decrease the silo effect that we see between organizations where one group is doing one thing and another group ends up inventing the wheel and doing something similar. If we have people talking with one another and listening to one another, perhaps these ideas can springboard and create new ideas rather than having everybody inventing pretty much the same thing going through the process of doing that, they can work together. So we thought this would be a good way to bring information to organizations as well as to caregivers about what can be done to cope with restrictions. We have quite a few different organizations that have agreed to be part of this. We've got uh, Ling Bloomsting with their second half program, which is a community outreach to caregivers and persons with dementia. We've got Brookdale Senior Living and the Wilder Foundation, they both have started to do in-person respite, even during the COVID restrictions. We want to know how are they able to do that safely. We're going to talk with Ted Bowman. Uh, he is a caregiver educator and grief counselor. He's done a presentation about stress and caregiver burnout. We're going to be speaking with uh, Bonnie from Jewish Family Service. She's, they've been doing a lot of outreach and even in-home activities. We'll be speaking with St. Anthony Park Area Seniors and Family Means, talking to them about how they've developed ways of reaching out to their clients. 
people have been so inventive in what they've been doing. They've made use of old technology and new technology. People are using the phone, people are using Zoom. People are figuring out ways to connect and stop the social isolation that has happened as a result of COVID restrictions. And what I'm really excited about is how this is going to be brought forward into whatever social environment we, we are dealing with in the coming years. Some of the things that have we've learned from having to go through this are going to benefit us in the future. So okay. even after the pandemic, this is still going to be relevant information. I agree. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, Wilder Foundation is also going to be part of this and yes. um, Chrissy Barron with um, Embracing Journeys. Yes, Embracing Journeys, right. We've had such a such great participation. It's it's uh, really quite remarkable. The many different groups that have agreed to be part of this series. Yeah, it, it'll it's going to be fun to do because the group is really very proactive, and so it'll be fun to see. One of the things that I saw earlier when I was doing uh, some of the interviews, I mean, most people were making changes, but I was hearing so many others weren't. And they were just staying stagnant and they really weren't meeting the needs. And some still aren't. They're, they're waiting for this to get over. And that is horrible for families. I mean, that's the bottom line. They're really, really struggling out there. So they need as many supports to, to help them through this process. Sarah, anything else that you want to add? Anything we missed? Oh, stuff I, I forgot to say in the beginning. When Roseville AD first got started, you and I developed a caregiver survey, which is still in use because we wanted a simple document that just gave us information about what did caregivers know and what did caregivers need. And so that's still being used and I'm delighted. We got our logo, which was developed by Gary Bowman, who's the communications director for the city of Roseville. And that was a wonderful gift from the city of Roseville. Our flyers, had all kinds of graphics on them that were designed by Lisa Lollaberti, who is now rotating off, but she had been a long-term member of city council who really thought this was important. I mean, the reach just keeps kind of growing and growing. And, you know, how long has the group been um, out there now? Because I think that says a lot too. Seven years. We started in September of 2013. The webpage launched uh, in August of 2014, and they've all been going nonstop since they launched, yeah. which is really, really exciting. And what's interesting is, you know, through the webpage, we have a Gmail account, and for months, nobody will write in anything, and then all of a sudden they do. And yesterday, I was checking the account, and somebody had written in two hours before saying, Are there virtual support groups for? XYZ population and I was able to send her something back right away. It had a link to what we have on the web page, which is updated every month. I'm delighted that we can provide any kind of assistance to people who really need it. Well, and the one thing I want to add there too is I can't tell you how many times we were told, no, that's never going to work. You can't maintain <laughs> it. You know, don't believe others. Believe in what you feel you can do and yeah. follow that path. The worst case that happens is it doesn't work out quite how you wanted it, and then you adjust from there. But don't let others smash your your dreams and your ideas, because look at what this group has done that yeah. no one ever thought could happen. So Paula, how about you? Any, any last minute comments before we wrap up? I really hope that people find the, this series, Dementia, Caring and Coping to be relevant, not just during the pandemic, but afterwards, looking back at what has happened and how people have coped and how people came through for others, I think is really important. So I'm hoping that this has a lasting effect and that we can continue our collaboration with these various organizations and groups in the future and continue to evolve and develop more activities, more services, and more ways of helping caregivers because that's really what when it comes down to it, that's what we're doing. 
We're helping caregivers and persons living with dementia live as well as possible. So if you want to contact uh, the Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia Community Action Team, you can go to their website, Roseville Alzheimer's forward slash Dementia Community Action Team. And you can email them at Roseville, A-L-Z, D-E-M, at gmail.com. Sarah's email direct is Roseville, A-L-Z, D-E-M, at gmail.com. And Paula's is Paula dot, and her last name is B-I-E-V-E-R at gmail.com. Thank you so much for all, everything you're doing. It's just, a, it's beautiful to hear, and it just really excites me uh, to be part of this. So thank you so much, and, you know, wish you nothing but continued success. Thank you, Lori, for helping present this important series. We really appreciate what you've been doing now and in the past to work with Roseville AD and your show Alzheimer's Speaks, which is just a treasure. Well, thank you. It's, thank uh, you. It's, it's been a fun journey, that's for sure. So again, for our audience, you too uh, can really make a big impact. You just have to step up and start. Find like-minded people. And once you start having that conversation, you will be shocked. How many people are going, hey, I, I could participate and maybe they can't, uh, maybe it's not a budget thing because this group primarily has worked without a budget. They had a minor grant at one point, but for most of the time, it, this is all volunteer stuff, but it's people taking their skill sets and saying, hey, I can do this and I can do that and we can do this. And even with printing, people just worked it into the budget or you know, having access to a community. Hey, we've got a room that's available. You know, it's just sitting there. So it's not costing anybody anything. These are the things we have to do, especially when budgets are tight, is collaborate and not try to do it all ourselves. So pass this on, and I hope you join us for the following series. Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>